Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to, the, uh, to you all to this first uh, Carmen's brand new Transport Talking Aloud series of industry lectures. It's wonderful to see you all, and we do appreciate everybody making the time um, to, to, to join this afternoon. And so we, we, we know we're in for a, a feast um, of, of, of interesting uh, slides and, and, and the talk, uh, and we really, really look, look forward to that. The Education Committee have worked very, very hard to make these possible, and we are indebted to all of them for all the work they have done, in particular over the last year, to develop this major educational programme of not only talks, but state school workshops for transport careers and uh, the initial facilities for our future uh, museum in, in Fleet Street. Now, these talks are designed to tackle contemporary transport and logistics issues, and every month, uh, what we hope will be a convenient time for you, taking up only an hour of, uh, of your busy lives. As we near the final completion uh, of Carmen Hall, we plan these talks will be there as soon as possible in our splendid new gallery, uh, which will be fully equipped for these, for these lectures. Please make a, a note in your diaries for the first Tuesday of each month. Uh, and next year, you can hear... Steve Gooding of the RAC on driverless futures, Sir Peter Hendy on our railways, Keith Richard on all ability transport, and Richard Hughes on London Ambulance. But today it is my enormous pleasure to welcome one of our own Carmen, Jolian Drury, who will talk to us about Brexit freight challenges. Jolian, over to you, thank you. Master Carmen, Madam Consort, Wardens, Court Assistants, and Worshipful Company of Carmen. Thank you for this opportunity for me to give this talk on Brexit freight challenges, of which there are still many. Thank you too to the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, for whose Public Policies Committee I represent with liveryman Chris Sturman, and Susan Morley for Customs on the Cabinet Office's Border Protocol Delivery Group's Logistics Steering Group. I'm going to talk to you for about 20 minutes about minimising friction at the border as a result of Brexit, and I'll talk about what our industry as the stakeholders with the government still need to do to make all this happen, and what the government's multi-agency Border Protocol Delivery Group are doing the master kindly gave you an overview of why I'm here. I'll cover the big numbers driving this, referring back to the recently updated border operating model, the key document that I assume that you have downloaded from .gov and committed all 158 pages to memory. We keep telling the CAIL team members amongst you in the bulletin and focus to do this and so there's no excuse for ignorance. Really all I'm saying this afternoon adds detail to the border operations model. We don't want any more queues in Kent like we experienced last Christmas or in 2015 when it was not COVID but just bad weather in the channel combined with industrial action in Calais when one of the fishermen's cousins poured liquid ready mix into the link span in Calais port which was less than helpful. Come to think of it, I really ought to dedicate this talk to past master Jeremy Gotch, sadly missed, who was so involved with cross-channel rail freight, with his bulk ferry-ready tank wagon network, well before the customs union, and who was instrumental in my election as a carman and a selection for the engineer and logistics staff corps, of which there are still a couple of members here in the audience. I suspect that if Jeremy was here, he would rue the day that we trashed so much rail freight and wharf infrastructure for the headlong race for housing, which now with COP26 and the route to net zero is being reinvented, which is another story for another day. Next slide, please. Remember that this whole Brexit shebang is because we're an island. Please don't attempt to read the words. It lists all the ports and airports around the coast. I added Dublin, as it remains a key route from Northern Ireland to Liverpool. And of all this list of ports for our immediate purposes, 
the most important route to keep fluid is at the very bottom right-hand corner, the short straits Dover to Calais, Dunkirk and Zeebrugge, and of course the Channel Tunnel. 88% of Roro goes through it, and a substantial number of total shipping provides the Roro service. To quote our partners across the water, rien ne change toujours la même chose, or what goes round comes round. Again, don't struggle with the text, but the right-hand column does indicate the changes that couldn't be avoided from the 1st of January this year. 200 million more customs declarations, 180,000 more companies who have only traded with the EU and not rest of world. And if no ongoing trade and cooperation agreement, known as the TCA, happens as a result of political intransigence, tariff and quota checks on top of a significantly increased workload already subjecting UK business to additional cost are likely to get imposed on the 1st of January. It's like the millennium bug, business continuity management, except this is going to happen. So this is why there is so much fuss about the Kent Corridor leading to the short straits. The slide is slightly old, but still current. If there's friction at Dover and the Channel Tunnel, the queue of trucks can fill all coastbound lanes of the M20 from junction eight to nine in about two hours. So you may say, why not go to other ports if there's trouble ahead? Really because tightly controlled supply chain managers working from their control towers, balancing drivers hours and mandatory rest periods with scheduled delivery windows, rely on robust timetabling and would rather vehicles wait in a predictable environment than launch out into the unknown territory of new routes. More about that later on. So a quick word about last Christmas when President Macron shut the French border on the 20th of December at three hours notice. I live only five minutes from junction nine on the M20 and took these pictures from a nearby motorway bridge. The Gurkhas did an amazing job with Kent County Council's resilience partnership. The realistic worst case scenario published in October last year by the cabinet office the threat of 7,000 coastbound trucks held up for two days in Kent was unerringly accurate and clarified the minds of unready traders, and it certainly woke up the Kent County Council. As a result, there is now sufficient HGV holding provided in Kent to cover this contingency. And on Friday last, I went to Ashford International Truck Stop, which has opened a further 660 spaces today, complete with showers, a gym, and in a really cracking restaurant. So we're getting to the position to give better conditions for drivers, which as you know, has been indicative of the shortage of drivers and young people not entering our industry. Now, apologize, this slide is far too busy, but it is a record of where the fluidity process has got to. Here are the headlines. Phase one from January this year was all about export compliance for the short straits route. But our EU partners impose documentation rules for UK exports from day one, acknowledging the trade and cooperation agreement. We elected not to go to for another year, but the key is to avoid it by getting the documents right before entering the corridor. And a lot of work was done at the beginning of the year of get your truck ready and in cab communications. <clears throat> but really it's common sense. All of us who are in the transport industry know that you never leave the yard without a delivery note unless you're empty. And the same now applies for export documentation. But for cross-channel empties, just to trip us up, pallets and return packaging, UK customs documentation is now, has been required and is now being enforced. So if you've got empty post pallets from a car factory, you really have to now enter a UK customs document for it. And the portal for accessing the goods vehicle movement service known as GVMS, the readiness system validating customs, safety and security and transit compliance for seamless cross-border movement can be from a laptop, tablet, a smartphone and the traffic manager, dispatcher and driver can do it. But in the end, it is still, as it's always been, 
the driver's responsibility. You've all read the border operations model, haven't you? It's a bit like Kipling, best beloved. And you can see the link on this slide and the authorized economic operator, AEO, trusted trader, transporter capability is an HMRC validation tool, which although demanding stakeholder certification and data monitoring is well worth applying for to smooth cross-border operations, which is a major brick in the government's Smart Borders 2025 program. Just as an aside, the Germans have over 12,000 AEO registrations and we were struggling to get 1,200 not very long ago. This is where the advice points are in blue. There are 37 advice points where you can get and your drivers can get advice on how to get across the channel and you can get COVID testing, but not inoculation. We all thought that was going away, didn't we, to the other day? And here we are again. But if their documentation is not correct, and I'm very keen on our SME chums not being frightened by all of this because they absolutely are at the moment. They can point their drivers to an HMRC DEFRA validation site, um, which are the ones in yellow, which I'll show you more of in a minute, which include offices of departure and arrival, which seal really the customs operations that you need to have ready to go. And if you've arrived to trigger that you're here and get your tax paid. Seven of these inland border posts will be working from January. Birmingham, Warrington, Northfield on the, that airport by the M11, M25 junction. Now, there are three in Kent, Sevington, Dover, Eurotunnel and Ebbsfleet. And there's going to be Holyhead by July. And remember, it's all in the border operations model. And here are the planned locations for inland border facilities also acting as border control posts. They're in place, and of course, eventually, other ports will have them on their land, as on this map. And you can see on the left-hand column, um, it's the temporary storage ports and the pre-lodgement on the right, which I'll come to in a moment, why it's like that. Would you believe that the map with the free port locations and their selected customs regimes are still not available? The issue is that the government in its wisdom required port operators to tender for the selection of their own facilities, at the same time having to elect to offer the customs pre-lodgement and or temporary storage models. The latter in the left-hand column is what ports traditionally employ, deep sea ports particularly. You don't have to declare or pay your duty for up to 90 days while the cargo or container remains bonded at the port. The pre-lodgement model, that's the right-hand column, is now what applies to RORO traffic. If you don't get confirmation that you have lodged your documentation with UK customs, you just don't get on the ferry or the shuttle to come to the, the UK. Now, a year of operation has demonstrated how inflexible this can be. EU exporters, and we have BPDG, have a series of meetings below the radar called BIFCOM between the operators in Zeebrugge, Harridge, uh, um, The Hook, um, Germany, Spain, France, and the messages that come back from EU exporters and their transport providers, some of them with more than a thousand lorries, is they can't change between the two methods on the fly if they face congestion at the first port of choice. And the BIFCOM team of BPDG are working really hard with HMRC to get this change, but I can't report that anything's happening much. So imagine you're in your truck and you're sending an unaccompanied trailer from Zeebrugge to Perth Fleet for a London delivery under the temporary storage rules, RORO. Needing to hurry, and you, it's a drop trailer one, okay? Needing to hurry it up by telling the truck driver to carry on to Calais to cross by the tunnel and then do a delayed delivery to the consignee, you can't change in travel to pre-lodgement. Where are the elephant traps? I'm going to dwell on this. The TCA is at risk under Article 16. As you know, it was a very skeletal agreement, trade and cooperation, not much of the latter. And 
it's being variously interpreted across the 27 member states. And it's meant to have 22 contributory committees, which iron out all the bits and pieces. Um, things like lack of professional standards between the countries and the different minutiae of the customs declarations between the different ports. And Zeebrugge is different from Antwerp, customer practice, and access to intermediaries, that's our um, freight forwarders and customs agents. And it's particularly difficult for composite imports, especially from if part of the composite and the groupage load is from another third nation. Rules of origin is going to continue to be a real bugbear. I've talked about pre-lodgement versus temporary storage. ECMT permits, you know, you'll remember those of you who used to drive into Europe, you had to carry all those satchels of things to every border to say that your splendid Foden with its trailer was allowed to go through Yugoslavia. Well, if the TCA fails, we're going to lose most of that. And Cabotin, which works very well, and there's a, um, a disposition about it at the moment, where, as you know, if you go to a foreign country within that country, when you dropped your load, you can pick up two more loads before you get your load home. At the moment, it is restricted to the country in Europe that you dropped your load to, not like it was before the TCA, when you could rattle across the Dutch border, pick up a load, go into France, rattle back to Belgium, pick up your final load. Doesn't happen. Groupage loads, costs and procedures. It's a real bugbear. I'm being very polite. I could have said something else for the, National, for the Northern Ireland Protocol. The whole thing about local loads, as we used to call them, from, say, Liverpool into Belfast, having to be stretch wrapped in Tampa evident stretch wrap with labels on, levering technology across the multi-agency borders. Um, you will have seen from, I think, slide three, that there are getting on for 30, if not more, border agencies involved. And there's the ability under the Borders 2025 programme for track and trace, much of which is in place and much of which I'm not allowed to talk about. And then the whole SPS thing, cytosanitary controls. And there is a glossary in the border operations model of all these names, but it's about products of animal origin. APB is mostly beef, high risk food, not of animal origin, which is nuts, dried fruit and dates, which might have salmonella and worse in them. And then E8 certification, which you mustn't forget, which is about labeling, marking, and that's all going to change and could get much more difficult if the TCA doesn't get resolved. And we are imposing our own labeling, I think, from next year. Again, the SMEs are desperate about it. Northern Ireland Protocol, I'm not going to talk about. And then specialist movements very close to my heart, like air cargo, and I'm getting into Michael Caine country here. Not many people know this. Are you aware that nearly 400,000 tonnes a year in each direction of trucked air cargo comes down the short straits run between 220, 2,200 and 2,500 super cubes each way a month and abnormal loads, which we used to just wave through because they were so big. And when the customs guys saw this huge thing coming, they used to say, on you go. And then there are the easements versus the legalities. And just to let you know, there's a new thing coming in just to excite us called the plastic tax, where HMRC are going to charge you for the stretch wrap and for numbers of tote bins. And that's no longer going to be discussed. And CILT have been very against it. And you can still go on trying to get it changed because I think it's inequitable to say the least. And actually, I'm not a politician. I'm absolutely apolitical. We just got to stop the politicians pretending we're at war. Imports now. Phase one was deferred until January next year with DEFRA checking the phytosanitary documentation in place. And phases two and three have slipped consistently to January, April and July next year. There was an absolutely vitriolic letter in Parliament from the food and cytosanitary parliamentary group to Mr Eustace last week saying even on November the 16th 
you told us one thing and now it's different again. So those of you who are into food imports and food component imports, remembering that of the 6,000 trucks a day that come across the channel into the UK, a third of food, a third of work in progress, which also includes food as well as car parts, and a third are express and general freight. It's pretty difficult, and you can read that. And the composite types of food, which may have nuts and meat and parsley and things, are going to have a really hard time. And we in Ashford have got Sevington, which is where a lot of it's going to be examined. So where is the UK control tower? Who is manning the UK control tower? With what authority to divert trucks off the highway to the inland IBFs? Certainly with ANPR for both trucks and trailers, which are now registered, track and trace on all main arteries can exist. And Border Force and the police and their framework service providers can monitor loads in transit. And it's much better, surely, that a proportion of loads, particularly from trusted traders, should continue either to inland border posts or ideally, just as they do now, <coughs> to their drop points at the RDCs, where customs staff used to be available. And the ecosystem of trust programme, which is currently in test, which some stakeholders, including CILT, carry a healthy mistrust for the depth of commercially sensitive supply chain transaction data inherent in the programme, will help to resolve it by 2025. We're not in 2022 yet. So to round up, this is the opportunity you've got to redesign your supply chains. Many of you have had the supply chain since Europeanisation 30 years ago. One of our colleagues here was a Unilever man. There are P&G people too. Well, remember, how much money was saved by changing to European plants and X factor great pricing and all that stuff. But it's changed. And free ports are getting ready. Unaccompanied trailer services are back up by 10% this year. And air cargo, partly due to COVID, is booming. On first to market stuff, you'll remember anyone who is in the apparel business, 15 days to counterfeit after new lines are launched. And do not ignore cross-channel rail, new services on CTRL1, possibly trailer trains, but that's a loading gauge issue by Jan Dagenham. I'm very keen on more rail through the tunnel because each train takes more than 40 HGVs off the road. And because of the driver shortage, traction between rail terminals and where they're going in the UK saves losing them for three days in Europe. So the final message, slightly over time, I'm afraid, is be prepared. There's no excuse for ignorance. There's no excuse for not getting your documents in place and right. And again, read the border operations model. And I would be delighted to take any questions, particularly from my heckling friends. Thank you. What a wonderful start to our new talk. Thank you, Gillian, for that wonderful, uh, wonderful praise of this afternoon. Um, I'm sure... I'm not alone in learning lots and lots of new things. And I've been in shipping and logistics for over 45 years. And some of that, uh, the stats and the information you gave us and shared has been uh, absolutely illuminating. And we do thank you very, very much uh, for that. Thank you. And now for some questions. Um, I think we, uh, Richard, if you'd like to uh, do the first uh, First couple of questions there. And Could I ask, uh, have imports and exports to and from the EU been affected since the TCA? Yeah, they have indeed. The EU taken as a whole in the U is the UK's largest trading partner. In 2020, UK exports to the EU were 251 billion, 42% of all UK exports and UK imports from the EU in 2020 were 301 billion, which is 50% of all UK imports. Now, UK trade with the EU fell dramatically last year amid disruptions to international trade uh, or caused by the, coron the, the, the virus, um, the pandemic. And UK, UK exports to the EU fell by 14% um, between 2019 and 2020, while imports fell by 19%. 
And over the same period, the value of UK exports fell, value, by 14%, while the value of the imports fell by 17%. Thank you. Most of this stuff mm. um, you can validate by the FT, which is my daily comic, and by other government sources which are available. Are there any questions from an anyone else on the screen at all? No. Can I ask another one then? So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Please do how, it. how has Brexit affected the economy of, of uh, GB, or UK, should I say? Well, the share of UK exports accounted for by the EU has generally fallen over time from 54% in 26 to 42% in 2020. And the share of UK imports accounted for by the EU fell from 58% in 2002, which is a age away, to 50% last year, um, which um, is pretty good, really, just losing 8% in that period of time. Steve Brinsler, um, I, Jolien, I, and you and I have talked about this subject many times, but um, in, in, in essence, what is the feeling uh, of people as to the additional costs that are being uh, borne by importers and exporters um, mm -hmm. due to the way that we are now having to work in order to get imports and exports uh, in and out the country? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, CILT and the European Logistics Association had a conference a bit earlier in the year with um, more than 30 manufacturers based on the mainland. And out of that, and the great thing about our industry is we always try, don't we, so nobody ever sees there's a problem. That's right. Um, but they reported back that um, transit times and cycle times of a load up and back were being increased by 20 to 30 percent and the costs many of which weren't recoverable were being increased from 30 by, by 20 to up to 50 percent and particularly the ones who are involved um, with consolidation um, were, were, were having considerable problems the big transporters mm. uh, the vabaras of this world and other brands, of course, are available, um, who are doing car parts and things, are just pressing on with it and just getting on with it. And they've got their control towers in Slovenia and they know where everything is. Um, but the smaller companies are having a terrible time. I wouldn't say they were going out of business, but some aren't just going to come here anymore. Mm. Okay. okay. Does that answer it? Uh, roughly, I, I think I think I don't think anybody's done a, a full account of the costs involved uh, because they'll come through in inflation eventually, uh, and they'll come through very fast. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's mm -hmm. that's another matter. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Michael Woods. My, my question is really about port development. Now, I, I assume we, we have to write off West Coast ports for uh, um, import and export to the EU, but um, Liverpool is expanding, um, but mainly from transatlantic uh, sources. But the northeast coast ports, such as Tyne Dock, maybe South Dock, um, Middlesbrough and, and ports in Scotland um, over time are starting to diversify and bring in some of the trade that would come through congested Calais, uh, Felixstowe and so on. So my, my question really is how long do you think it would take to diversify our, our in, inward port facilities so they could make a real contribution rather than the odd headline for politicians to boast about. And no, I'm not being political. Well, you can probably answer my question to me for yourself, because a lot of the reliance we were going to have on rail connections to the East Coast ports, which are going to make it all so much easier, just got canned. Mm -hmm. And that's going to set it back a bit. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. The free, the, there are a number of free ports as well involved on the East Coast, and there are others planned for Scotland, but it comes under the Scottish um, administration. I'm not going to say anything more than as soon as possible, because it's totally impossible to know how some of the infrastructure, which is as yet not ready, is going to be in place by next year. 
it's got to be a bit better than the usual porter cabin with a freight forwarder standing with a clipboard outside, hasn't it? Absolutely. It's going yeah. to attract a significant number of drop trailers from Zeebrugge and from Germany, as well as coastal container traffic into our East Coast ports. And we're going to have to do that because the transshipment business with the shortage of containers and, you know, 360 major container ships not getting into port around the world at the moment, they're going to not come necessarily mm. to Gateway and to Felixstowe if they're behind schedule. They're going to whack their way into Rotterdam and Bremerhaven, yeah. and we're going to transship 300 containers, which we hope will come up to the northern ports where they're destined. There is something very strange still, isn't there, about historically driving on the short straits and driving all the way up to Dumbarton. Mm. Um, mm. And it's because of reliability and you know where your driver is. And we've seen with the problems which I think have been resolved at Felixstowe, the children's puzzle thing of freight containers in the stack and the one you want is the bottom left hand on the right hand side. And however good your transtainers are, it's going to take time. Yeah. And your software has to keep up with it. So it's going to take time and everyone has got to work together to make it happen. Our next question comes from Richard Corneli. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a quick question. I mean, before we went into the EU, we used to move product between us and Europe. Uh, and we had a system, um, I think it was called CIPRO, that helped um, organise all this. I remember taking a CPC International, and I'm really quite involved in that, understanding that. Um, I spent a lot of time in Europe um, working for Wing Wincanton and PO Trans European. Um, but I mean, surely as lessons learned going back then, you know, with their paperwork and their systems, I know they've closed now, I think it's 2010, but couldn't we learn lessons from that? Yep. Yes, um, of course, and would that they were. Um, yeah. There are a number of us here of a certain age who yeah. remember cabs full of satchels and um, choosing your route very carefully for the customs posts that weren't going to hold you up for a day. Yeah. Um, th there's, a, there's a certain amount of difficulty through everybody in the business other than us not remembering it. So as you remember on the mainland, on certain routes, many of the custom sites were run by families. And um, certainly once you got sort of east of Greece, they were run by families. And you got to know, and you always had, as is your freight agent with his clipboard waiting for you. And um, I won't go any further about inducements, but it got you through. And there's none of that anymore. And it's all relying on software and it's all got to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And the real things that made it work was the it's a hobby horse of mine, okay? The real things that made it work was the responsibility of the driver. He just wasn't an agency bloke. He was, with his tractor mm -hmm. unit, responsible for his load. Mm -hmm. And as the control towers have got more powerful and the 3PLs have got more powerful, the driver's responsibility ebbs away. And I think we probably have to get back to that mm -hmm. quite soon, actually. Our next question comes from a very patient Jim French. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Good afternoon. Two questions, if possible, slightly connected. You, you made a comment earlier on that, that said that if a vehicle was routed back um, or was routed from um, the mainland across to the UK via a Roro service, uh, it was not possible to change that to, a, to an accompanied service if perhaps there were circumstances that made it um, uh, desirable for the customer to do so. Um, what is the reason that you can't change it? Is this, H is HMRC it legislation. Is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, and um, write your MP or go and knock on their door in Croydon, get them to change it. it it's because it, it's not really because of the change from chief to, G to GMS or whatever it's called, that there just seems to be an unwillingness or an anxiety among people who think people are going to cheat rather than just go to their jobs um, mm. that need these sorts of controls. 
Um, at the moment, you can do it, but you have to go to a truck stop and you have to start again on the documentation. Yeah. And if you've got your um, forwarder to hand and you've got your um, iPad to hand, you can probably do it, but it's not on the fly, which is a pity. Yeah, OK, thanks. And secondly, if I could ask you, please, prior to Brexit, I believe the percentage of UK registered vehicles going across was around about 15%. Has that changed at all since Brexit? Yes, it's you less. Know. It's about 90% on short streets are European registered. So it's actually reduced then. The, the number of UK hauliers that are wanting to go onto the continent has actually, actually uh, reduced. Has reduced and is reducing partly due to the driver shortage. Mm. And one of the issues we have in Kent is people do drop trailer work. Do you remember in the 70s when we were doing long haul and short haul just within the UK? We did drop, yeah. drop trailers um, so that the drivers in the north of the country could go home and go home at night. Yeah, and we yeah. did the same in the south. Now, that has stopped during the customs union. Hence, our pals from the Eastern Europe trudge their way as trampers all the way up through Europe into the UK. No disrespect to them. They're my neighbours, get 15 in my lay-by every night. However, um, one of the ways of solving the driver shortage is to employ drop trailers and places like Ashford Truck Park, which allow trailer changing yeah. under controlled conditions rather than people doing it in my lay-by in the middle of the night without marker lights. Yeah. Um, is is one of the things that's really got to happen. Hey, our, ne our next question, uh, well, we've got a hand up anyway, is uh, our master Nick Leister. Well, it's it's the consort. Yeah. Oh. So, so basically, Jolian, you partly answered the question that I was going to ask. When you were talking, you were talking about roll on, roll off, um, you know, so that we all remember where the lorry turned up and then he, the cargo was taken on and the driver could drive away and it was taken off at the other side by a different driver. You said that's increased. Yes. You also said that there's been an increase in the facilities available for HGV drivers at various points. What more do you see that we need to do? And obviously, I, you know, I'm sort of thinking that, you know, partly as a, a lecture and education that we need to do to structure change and positive change to introduce this right. national shortage as, an ed, as a career that will be encouraging to those at the moment looking to go into um, something and not knowing exactly what that is. How can we encourage them to go into HGV driving? Baroness Veer on Friday announced at the opening of the truck stop, I think it was 32.5 million to increase conditions at the motorway service areas for overnight drivers. Um, tiny amount, actually, we've asked for much more. And the um, Transport Select Committee tomorrow, of which Kevin Richardson from CILT is speaking, is going to be about exactly that. CILT has been working very hard and with others in the industry like Logistics UK and the RHA and the unions to get a proper career path in place in the whole of the supply chain industry. So it's not just mm. driving. The career yes. path is for everybody, irrespective of gender and type and everything, to have an access and training in the industry. You might drive for a bit, you might drive a forklift for a bit, you might go and sell for a bit, you might manage for a bit. The whole idea is that everybody gets a full education across our fantastically interesting industry. Yes. And parents don't go to careers officers in their schools and say, my child is not going to go into this dirty industry because it's a fantastic industry and we do so mm. much for the country and it's not dirty and the driving conditions are terrific. Jenny Tipping, I think, is speaking at the Transport Select Committee. I represented the Institute in 2016 and she was there as well and an excellent guy from Unite. And it was all promised by government. The minister changed within a fortnight. 
nothing was done. The employment levy came in, which is shooting both uh, yourself in both feet. And we've really got to go on pressing for help in education, in facilities, and in making the tax system beneficial for companies with apprenticeships. Yes. Yeah. I was trying not to be a politician. I didn't do yeah. that. Yeah. No, no, no. You did very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Clive. I was delighted earlier on, Jelian, that you referred to Jeremy. Um, uh, for many, many years, a good mate um, and a rail man. And I remember being told when I joined the Carmen's in his, uh, <coughs> company that we weren't just about haulage, we were also about shifting people around and we were also about railways because we are the surface transport industry delivery. So referring back to Jeremy, to trains and to the old, the old canard that we were always told that, oh, well, uh, trains are not a good way of shifting freight, much as it is on trucks. We're faced with the three P's at the moment, plague, people, that's the HGV shortage and so on, and politics. And it's in the last one that I want to ask my frame my question. What do you think might, could or will be done uh, by the, tra the rail industry, where, as you pointed out, you can get volume, 40 trucks per train, to start cutting through the regulatory morass that the politicians have imposed on us with Brexit, <clears throat> to see whether or not, given railways are internationally owned, and a great deal of our rail network is in fact owned in our European investors and corporates, is that my question is, do you see a way in which that international cooperative transport methodology can be harnessed to crack through some of the regulation to the benefit of the whole surface transport freight industry? Well, I think we're being aided, Clive, very much by COP26 and the need to hold, uh, to reduce our emissions. And it, the industry has already risen to the challenge. There are a number of increasing intermodal services um, particularly out of Durft and Hams Hall and um, interchanges um, within the United Kingdom very, very successfully. And if you go to my favourite annual exhibition, Intermodal, you'll see them advertising like Bilio. Um, and one of the areas which I'm particularly interested in, which is beginning to redevelop, is reconnecting into post beaching branch lines for freight. Um, the idea that you do have to have a driver for everything and it always has to be in a large vehicle is not necessarily true. And there are various projects with smaller containers that are intermodal within the UK, which trans can transfer to a seven and a half ton chassis with or without a forklift or something clever, are on the stocks. The difficulty is always, or the opportunity is always, there's never a difficulty, that with our traction shortage, even when you've taken the leg from Durft to Bathgate, you still need drivers to drive the, the container of whichever type it is onto the RDC or even direct to the shop until we get as... Um, the consort so ably asked more drivers and people in place, it's difficult to get it absolutely right, but we're working very hard at it. And I believe that there is a twitching within the Department for Transport and DEFRA to help make this happen, but we really have to press for interoperability between government departments, not to trip over each other. And our industry is getting really, really good at it. So, yes. Thank you. Alison. Hello, everybody. Um, just one thing. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Have we not already, in this last 12 months after we've had a push, got 40,000 extra drivers that we've now trained? Yes. That... yes so yes, so we, and, and what was what was what were we short of? Were we short of was it 80, 80 90,000, something like that? Yeah, well, the, the chap in my lay by the other day who's driving short distance deliveries for Sainsbury's said, mm. well, why should I go back? 
to trunking when I'm paid 15 pounds a day more for doing short haul mm. and I get home every night. So we really did rely on our East European cousins. We really did in, uh, rely on cabotage from our European transport and we remain short and all encouragement that we can give which is already happening because the driving tests are being uh, are increasing and there are various ways of reducing the time it takes to be an HGV driver but some of us will remember the way we started and got our class one licenses was being mate to the driver and being told to do the trailer swaps when we got to the RDCs and learning that way. And that seems to be outlawed a bit at the moment. And um, it's um, quite difficult to accelerate health and safety when so much is about safety and not trusting people. Yeah, I understand that because I know uh, with apprentices, if they're under at the age of 18, there's certain hours that they can't work. And a lot of my customers are, are, are 24 seven. So they couldn't take them on because they do night work and they can't, couldn't work after a certain time. But there is also something um, that I've been working with a DWP where they're actually um, paying. Um, I'm trying to think what it's called, where they're actually paying for people to be a mate for three or six months if, if you like to see whether they like it or not and then companies local to me are then actually putting them through their tests and and a lot of the the, the barrier is is they physically or that they they just haven't got the money to put themselves through the through the driving test so i think one company alone that i know i think has already put 18 through and they're really yeah. good really good uh people women included but yes yeah. they have changed their their um their plans so that um you know they're not not out all the time or they are trailer swapping etc so i think as an industry we need to look at uh the drivers that are coming in filtering in with uh, the old school if i can say that um we we make sure that they do fit we we do accommodate and we do change our ways and not not be like we used to be. So that if we do need short or we do need long ball, then, then we work that, I think. Uh, everything you say is true. And everything in this industry at the moment is both and. Nothing mm. can be set aside. We've got to do all of it. And the other bit that's missing is the insurance issue. Mm. Where insurance mm. companies are very loath to put a third of a million pound outfit in the hands of a 19 year old, you know. Well, it's time we moved on now. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us here this afternoon and for all those wonderful questions, which have been very inspirational and, and very interesting and, and interlinked uh, with, uh, with, with Jolien immensely. Thank you, Jolien, for your illuminating and yeah, inspirational yeah. address once again. Um, we look forward to seeing you all again. Uh, don't forget the uh, 4th of January when we uh, meet with Steve, or Steve Gooding. Uh, director of the RAC Foundation, and not only remotely, but we hope uh, maybe even in Carmen's Hall as well, where we can enjoy the new facility. Um, yes. Please remember on the link, uh, there was the donations, if you were able, if you feel able, uh, all, all donations, I think, that, as the phrase goes, are warmly received. Um, and, and obviously, please, one other thing you can perhaps do as we go into the Christmas period, we wish everybody a very, very happy Christmas and a happy new year. And the best way of encouraging others to join us on these lectures is by word of mouth. So please share the word around within Carmen, within your friends and family, and we hope to see you all again uh, on the 4th of January. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>